Last year, President Donald J. Trump moved the United States Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. As is well known, he honored a long-standing American commitment that hadn't been fulfilled by previous administrations. This commitment was in the 1995 Jerusalem Embassy Act, proposed back then by Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole and Senate Minority Leader Tom Daschle, and adopted by an overwhelming majority of the U.S. Senate in a vote of 93 to 5. There was a bipartisan consensus in America to support Israel. Now that, that Jerusalem Embassy Act called for American recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and the establishment of a U.S. Embassy there. I was privileged to be at the opening ceremony this time. I recalled back in 1999 when I was Israel's ambassador to the United Nations and I sought instructions from my Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and my Foreign Minister Ariel Sharon about how to respond to a new Palestinian provocation against us at the UN involving a resolution calling for the internationalization of Jerusalem. Sharon simply told me over the phone to read over the Knesset speech of our first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, from December of 1949, in which he bravely declared before the nations of the world that he was moving Israel's capital to Jerusalem. I said bravely because many world leaders advised him not to do it. Ben-Gurion reminded the international community that the people of Israel had, quote, faithfully honored for 2,500 years the oath sworn by the first exiles by the rivers of Babylon not to forget Jerusalem. Ben-Gurion honored that oath and moved the capital. But the question of the U.S. Embassy remained unresolved for years to come. Meanwhile, Jerusalem has been under a steady assault in all the main bodies of the United Nations, particularly over the last 15 years, propped up by that organization's notorious block voting. Within days of President Trump's announcement, the UN General Assembly convened to oppose the move. This was the latest action taken at the UN to replace historical truth with fake history in order to advance a hostile diplomatic agenda against the State of Israel and against the Jewish people. One year earlier in 2016, UNESCO, the United Nations Education, Science and Culture Organization, asserted that the Temple Mount was connected to Islam, but it refused to acknowledge any Jewish connection whatsoever, or for that matter, any Christian connection. In its resolution, UNESCO used only Islamic terms for the area, namely the Al-Aqsa Mosque and Haram al-Sharif. The words Temple Mount were completely missing in the UN document. Israel's adversaries and their allies took this campaign to the UN Security Council in New York with the infamous Resolution 2334, adopted in December 2016 during the transition period in Washington between the outgoing Obama administration and the incoming Trump administration. By yet again branding Jerusalem as, quote, occupied Palestinian territory, unquote, the UN was insinuating that Israel had no standing in Jerusalem and that its old city, 
the Temple Mount, and the Western Wall were Palestinian. It was as though a Palestinian state once existed and controlled Jerusalem, which is not just a false narrative, it's a complete lie. This fit perfectly with the Palestinian assertion that came to life at the July 2000 Camp David summit between President Bill Clinton, Prime Minister Ehud Barak, and the PLO chairman Yasser Arafat. It was there that Arafat declared that there never was a temple in Jerusalem. Now, Arafat knew exactly what he was doing, because if there was no temple, then Israel had no historical claim in Jerusalem. Arafat said, there's nothing there. His loyalists would say, go prove it. Go prove there was a temple. You know, they knew that Israel does not authorize archaeological digging on the Temple Mount. So that's how they confidently said, go prove it. But President Clinton responded to Arafat by saying, not only the Jews, but I too believe that under the surface there are remains of Solomon's temple. What Clinton did not have to spell out was that the temple was also significant for Christianity. Denying its history entailed an affront to the Christian faith as well. So what have the UN resolutions on Jerusalem accomplished? They have legitimized doubt beyond the walls of the UN, in the international mass media, and in academia. You see, words really do matter. The New York Times entitled an article in October 2015, quote, historical certainty proves elusive at Jerusalem's holiest place, unquote. What does elusive mean? Now that's not a quiz. But it's important to know what they tried, what they were trying to say. It means hard to prove. Then there's the infamous Professor Juan Cole of the prestigious University of Michigan, who argued in 2010, quote, Archaeology does not show the existence of a Jewish kingdom, unquote, in Jerusalem. No kingdom, no temple, no historical connection for Israel. Is all that true? It came, after all, from one of the Big Ten schools in the United States. Do you want the truth? Do you want to know what really went on in ancient Jerusalem? Well, these are seals from the royal family of the kings of Judah. They were found at the foot of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So who's right? Archaeology found in the earth next to the Temple Mount, or professors at the University of Michigan? <laughs> you tell me. Now these names, these seals from the kings of Judah, they all carry the names of the descendants of King David in ancient Hebrew. But the core of the international debate caused by UNESCO has been focused on whether a temple once stood on the Temple Mount and the veracity of our common Judeo-Christian narrative. Anyone here in the audience read ancient Greek? That was a rhetorical question. <laughs> this 2,000-year-old stone found next to the Temple Mount is an original sign in ancient Greek marking the rules of entry to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. This stone, or the stone on the left, is from the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. But the full text of the Greek inscription 
is in the Istanbul Archaeology Museum. I'm surprised President Erdogan hasn't gotten to it. It makes specific reference to the temple precinct. The word highlighted in orange on the right, Hieron, is the ancient Greek word for the temple. They wanted proof. Here's the part of the truth. Fast forward to the year 70 of the Common Era and the destruction of the temple. The Romans did not have Polaroid cameras or CNN, but to celebrate their victory over the Jews, they created this bas-relief, which you can see if you visit Rome and go to the Arch of Titus. It's right next to the Colosseum. You can see Roman soldiers carrying sacred treasures looted from the temple in a victory march. We know from Roman sources that the spoils from the temple were used to pay for erecting the Colosseum. Thus, the holiest site in ancient Israel finance the place where Jews and Christians were thrown to the lions for adhering to their faith. Now, people sometimes ask, what's all this fuss about the temple? Well, in the Bible, the temple's construction was the only event dated in relation to the exodus from Egypt 480 years earlier. It was where the two tablets with the Ten Commandments were housed. Therefore, the temple symbolized freedom and national identity. But the Romans did not manage to snuff out the will for freedom. Some 60 years after the temple's destruction, a Judean general named Bar Kokhba rose up in rebellion and fought off six Roman legions. His letters have been discovered in the Judean desert, like this one right here. Bar Kokhba articulated the goal of his revolt on coins that were minted at the time and found today. They call for the freedom of Jerusalem. In Hebrew, Lama'an Cherut Yerushalayim. Speaking of the Romans, one last historical fact before we continue. After crushing the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135, the Roman occupiers decided to annihilate all Jewish hope for freedom. They feared that freedom would be contagious and that revolts would soon spread across the Mediterranean to all parts of the Roman Empire. So they renamed Jerusalem Elia Capitolina, and they also gave the land of Judea a new name, Syria Palestina. This is the actual origin of the name Palestine. This was an attempt to erase Judea from the world's consciousness forever. That was the methodology then, and that is the methodology today, attacking our very identity. Today it's called the delegitimization of Israel, and it is the ideology at the heart of the BDS movement. It wrongly assumes that we have lost the conviction to defend Jerusalem and ourselves. Well, let me tell you something. It didn't work back then, and we're not going to let it work now. There are those who say that after Bar Kokhba's defeat and the Roman annihilation of Judea, there were no Jews left with any connection to the past. Yet according to Christian and Jewish sources, brought forward by Professor Moshe Gil in his monumental study, A History of Palestine, published by Cambridge University Press. And I quote, the Jewish population residing in the country at the time of the Muslim conquest in the seventh century consisted of direct descendants 
of the generations of Jews who had lived there since the days of Joshua bin Nun, unquote. We were there and we continued to be there. And then there are those who claim that the rebirth of Israel represents a foreign colonialist implant. The facts show otherwise. Thousands stream back whenever they could to their ancient homeland. In the 1400s, Jewish immigration increased to such a scale that the Franciscans petitioned the Pope to issue an edict prohibiting Jewish sea captains from carrying Jewish passengers to the Holy Land. If there was no deep, deep Jewish connection to Jerusalem, no surge in immigration, then why would the Franciscans need to petition against their travel? Because they were traveling and they were returning home. Here you see an ancient firman, an official document of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. It's dated 1584. It calls for an investigation of the increase in Jewish synagogues in the land of Israel. By the mid-19th century, the British consulate in Jerusalem determined, according to this diplomatic cable here on the left, that Jews had already restored their majority in Jerusalem in 1863, long before Theodore Herzl, before the British mandate, or before the establishment of Israel. We were back and Jerusalem was ours. On the right is a man who you've heard of, but I doubt you ever saw his photograph. His name is William Seward. He was President Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State. In 1870, after he completed his term in office, he actually visited Jerusalem. And his memoirs show that he made the same observation as the British about a Jewish majority being there. Therefore, you cannot attach the Jewish return to Jerusalem to the European colonialist locomotive of the late 19th century. The Jews came back under their own free will. Fast forward to 1948. The newly proclaimed State of Israel found itself attacked by five Arab armies, assisted by whom? by the colonial powers, the British and the French. The old city of Jerusalem was besieged. Its Jewish population was ethnically cleansed, as you see on the left. That's Zion Gate. The Jews are rushing through to escape the bombardment. And you also can see its holy sites were obliterated, which you can see in the photograph on the right. Now, what did the United Nations do when, these, with, when this occurred, when the Jews were thrown out of the old city, and when the holy sites of Judaism were blasted? Did you hear anything coming out of New York? Because You didn't, because the United Nations didn't lift a finger to stop the wanton destruction in Jerusalem. Israelis were prevented for years from reaching their holy sites, and Jerusalem remained divided until its reunification in 1967 by Tzahal, the Israel Defense Forces. So let me be absolutely clear. We, the people of Israel, given this experience, we will never divide Jerusalem. Today, the threats to religious freedom have not ended. Across the Middle East, the holy sites of all the great faiths are under a new assault by the forces of jihad. In Afghanistan, 2,000-year-old Buddhist statues were obliterated by the Taliban. In Syria, the legacies of thousands of years destroyed by ISIS. In Egypt, Coptic churches and cathedrals burned their worshipers killed. This isn't from the Middle Ages. This is from now. Across the entire region, Christians are persecuted and driven from their homes. 
Even mosques are destroyed by the same violent intolerance. And right next to Israel, joint units of the Palestinian Fatah and Hamas invaded the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem in 2002, which you see here, desecrating it and taking its clergy hostage. One of them put up a sign to the Israeli soldiers, please help. Here you see the tomb of the biblical Joseph in Nablus, which was overrun in 2000 by mobs carrying hammers and crowbars to dismantle it. Those mobs included members of the Palestinian security forces. What is clear today, more than ever, is that the only force that will protect Jerusalem for all the great faiths is the modern state of Israel, which has not forgotten which has not forgotten how its enemies sought to forcibly cut its connection with the holy city in the past physically and to this day tries to cut us off in international in international fora today under israel jerusalem works israel has fended off the physical assaults on jerusalem and will continue to defend itself as prime minister netanyahu said we will never ask your sons and daughters to come to defend us. But we do need your help to defeat the diplomatic assaults Jerusalem faces today. We need your help to fight fake history. We need your help to fight for the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1891, there was a prominent Protestant clergyman named Reverend William E. Blackstone who collected signatories to a petition calling for a return of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland. He argued that the Jews had never given up legal title to the land of their ancestors, but rather had been expelled by force. Blackstone recruited the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court the Speaker of the House of Representatives to sign the petition, leaders of the American business elite and political elite also signed and joined him, like J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller. Many members of Congress, including a future president named William McKinley, also lent their support to, Goldstone, to Blackstone. Blackstone's petition was presented in 1891 to President Benjamin Harrison. The idea spread like wildfire. Pastor Hagee, you are carrying on Reverend Blackstone's vision. And what we see here exceeds his wildest dreams. But what popularized your vision is a simple point. The founding fathers of this country, the United States of America, read the Bible. They learned what freedom meant. We are bound together by our common love of liberty, part of what makes America great. And it is a love which, which must be based on truth. Israel's ancestors fought for the freedom of Jerusalem, as the coin from the Bar Kokhba revolt attests. Looking at this history, freedom must never be taken for granted, but faithfully protected by every generation. That is what America has done, and that is what we the people of Israel will do. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador.